Science! Welcome to Science This Week. This week kicks off part one of our three-part spooky science series, where I'm going to delve into the science, the real science, behind some of the most iconic imagery surrounding my favorite holiday, Halloween. And we're going to start with probably the most famous monster out there, the monster. I'm, of course, talking about the abhorrent creation of Dr. Victor Frankenstein. Now, the novel Frankenstein was written by Mary Shelley in 1818. And popular culture is definitely to blame for the confusion you might have. The good doctor's name is Victor Frankenstein. The monster is just that, just the monster, not named Frankenstein, as pop culture would have us all believe. In the story itself, is always referred to as the creature, the monster, the fiend. But what real science of that day inspired Mary Shelley and her novel? There's a ton to unpack from Frankenstein. Its themes, its place in pop culture, its place in science fiction and horror and bigger allegories than that, and we don't have the time to get into all of that. This will just be a fun glimpse into some of the science behind what Victor Frankenstein sets out to do and what really embodies the pile of body parts brought to life in the story. There were two prominent scientific advances that happened in the mid-1700s to the early 1800s that might have had a hand in inspiring Mary Shelley's work. The first was the discovery that sometimes it was possible to resuscitate someone who appeared dead from drowning. This was brand new in the mid-1700s. The second was the emerging field of electrophysiology. And this investigated how electricity affected the limbs and tissues in animals. So let's start with reviving the dead, specifically people who have drowned. This was especially linked to Mary Shelley and her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, Wollstonecraft was a writer, a philosopher, and a very prolific and passionate advocate for equal educational rights for men and women. But she also suffered from depression. And in 1795, she attempted to kill herself by throwing herself off a bridge into the Thames River in London. She wrote in her suicide note, when you receive this, my burning head will be cold. I shall plunge into the Thames where there is the least chance of my being snatched from the death I seek. This was a very reasonable request, actually, because during the late 18th century, people started to realize that if you pulled someone from the water quickly and issued these brand new resuscitation techniques, they could sometimes be brought back from being apparently dead. And some of these techniques were precursors to what would become modern-day CPR, forcing air into victims' airways, performing chest compressions. But some of the techniques were not as effective and showed signs of the time, like administering bloodletting and also tobacco smoke enemas. Ugh. But more and more people were being successfully resuscitated all the time. And this actually created a widespread misunderstanding of this knowledge. People were now forced to deal with the idea that you could appear dead, but still be alive. And maybe your life force was trapped and suspended inside of your body. That was incredibly scary. On a side note, a direct result of this fear led to the rise of what was called safety coffins, which allowed for someone who was still alive after burial to signal for their release by ringing a little bell. Oh yeah. And Mary Shelley's mom, Mary Wollstonecraft, she was fated to be one of these people who was saved. After jumping from the bridge, her unconscious body was pulled from the river and resuscitated using these brand new scientific techniques. She wrote after the fact, I have only to lament that when the bitterness of death was passed, I was inhumanly brought back to life and misery. She went on to live for another two years and published some more work and she died 11 days after giving birth to her second child, Mary. Now, how about 
electrophysiology. You have to remember that while science knew about electricity and documented it, very little was actually known about the actual force itself. It wasn't actually until 1752 when Benjamin Franklin made his famous experiments with lightning and proved that electricity and lightning were one and the same. In 1781, a surgeon in Italy by the name of Luigi Galvani began experimenting with electricity on animals. While dissecting a frog near a static electricity machine, the frog's leg jumped from the charge transferred to the scalpel, as we all know, but Galvani did many more experiments, deducing that the electric charge must reside in the frog itself, and dubbed it animal electricity. This was widely accepted for many years. Italian physicist Alessandro Volta actually challenged this idea by saying that the frog was actually just a conductor, and the same result could be achieved with two different metals and chemicals. And in 1799, he created what he called the voltaic pile, or the voltaic stack, which used chemical reactions to produce electricity. And this would be the precursor to automotive lead acid batteries and voltaic cells. Now, if you're a video game fan out there, you might have heard the term voltaic before, uh, fighting the voltaic phantoms in the game Bioshock, or using voltaic bombs in the famed Assassin's Creed series. These two opposing schools of scientific thought led to a man named Giovanni Aldini, who was actually the nephew of Galvani. Aldini believed in his uncle's work, the animal electricity but did not discredit Volta's work either and began to try to demonstrate the medical benefits of electrical current by using the battery to heighten the animal electricity. This culminated in an experiment in 1803 at Newgate Prison in London. Eldini inserted metal rods hooked up to a voltaic cell into the mouth and ears of George Foster. Foster was deceased. He was recently executed for drowning his wife and child. The Newgate Calendar, which was a book published about the criminals of Newgate Prison, describes what happened next. On the first application of the process to the face, the jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver, and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and one eye was actually opened. In the subsequent part of the process, the right hand was raised and clenched, and the legs and thighs were set in motion. Like the discovery that the nearly drowned could be resuscitated and seemingly brought back to life, Aldini's demonstrations provoked new scientific and philosophical inquiries into the nature of life itself. He also liked to tour around and make decapitated corpses sit up under intense electrical current. Super creepy. These were all things that Mary Shelley knew about when she was writing Frankenstein at age 18. Her and her circle of friends would talk about the current events of science and philosophy, and it was definitely something that was in her wheelhouse when she was coming up for her idea for a horror story about a scientist who yearned to create life and then was horrified by what he made. But what of making the monster? As I've been talking, we've all pictured thunder and lightning as Dr. Frankenstein yells to his servant Igor to ready the body parts on the metal slab as they raise them to the heavens to be electrocuted to life. But this is pop culture skewing the narrative yet again. Both the use of electricity and the cobbled together image of Frankenstein's monster were more the result of James Whale's popular 1931 film adaptation of the story. In Shelley's original work, Dr. Frankenstein actually discovers a previously unknown elemental principle of life, and that power allows him to basically create life. But the process is left very ambiguous for the tale, so you can draw your own conclusions. But could this be done? Could you create life, this monster? Could it be done then? Could it be done today? The obvious answer is a basic no to both of those. But as we get closer to present day, it gets a little more creepy. The biggest problem in Mary Shelley's time? Not actually the scientific advancements of the day, but rather just the simple preservation of anatomical material. Bodies tend to rot rather quickly, especially if you've seen any zombie films. Now obviously, there is refrigeration, 
Cryo Freezing Now, but both of these were came way after Shelley's novel. Back then, there was a myriad of different techniques used to preserve body parts and internal organs. Flesh was usually dissolved from bones in macerating tubs to preserve skeletons. Skin and nerves were dried out on huge boards, sometimes on the roof of the lab. Ugh. To try and preserve soft tissue, substances such as turpentine, mercury metal, and even mercury salts were used, which would stall some of the decay, but be incredibly toxic for the scientists trying to use them. One of the most successful techniques for tissue preservation was actually alcohol. But if you use too little alcohol, mold can grow, and if you use too much alcohol, it will actually denature the skin and tissue you're trying to preserve the optimum level of alcohol was actually found to be about the same as what was in whiskey. But could we make the monster today? Thanks to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, they released this wonderful graphic by Adolfo Aranz, and writer David Schultz breaks it all down. Let's look at this modern-day monster as we all play Dr. Frankenstein. The first thing we could do today is obviously transplant. Transplant technology has become leaps and bounds in the last few decades. In fact, the kidney was first transplanted in 1950 and remains the most commonly transplanted organ today, followed by the liver, the heart, the lung, the pancreas, and intestines. A modern day Frankenstein could also transplant tissues such as skin, nerves, cornea, cartilage, and even bones. More cutting edge are faced transplant. Think the movie Face Off. Performed 37 times actually between 20, 2005 and 2015. Currently, two surgeons say they want to perform human head transplants, perhaps better called whole body transplants. Though most scientists say reconnecting all the nerves within the spinal cord will remain science fiction for a long time. Look it up. It's crazy. The next piece of the modern day monster puzzle could be lab grown organs. Skin, urethras, bladders, blood vessels, and muscle can all be produced by taking a patient's own cells and growing them on a biodegradable scaffold in the lab. And scientists are using 3D printing and other techniques in efforts to grow more complex structures such as heart, livers, kidneys, and more. Next, we move to mechanical parts. Think cyborgs. Machines could substitute for organs in modern versions of this creature. Dialysis machines already function as external kidneys, and pacemakers work inside the body for years. What's on the horizon is might be fully artificial pancreas, eyes, and lungs. Organs such as the heart and lungs could be built to outperform natural ones, extending the limits of human performance. Could we be on the precipice of immortality? In that same vein, what about bionics? Robotic exoskeletons controlled with a remote are actually helping paraplegics regain control over their legs today. Missing limbs can be replaced by prosthetics and the most advanced of which can directly read brain commands through electrodes placed on the skull. But even the best prosthetics of today can't simulate the unconscious adjustments that smooth out normal gestures. They still move more like Frankenstein's monster than Luke Skywalker. In the future, artificial limbs could learn to make some decisions on their own using cameras and algorithms to allow for smoother movements. And also strength and speed could be increased to near superhuman levels. But quite possibly the creepiest scientific advancement is why build a human from spare parts if you can make one to order from an embryo? Scientists agree it is already feasible and wrong to clone a human. 21st century Dr. Frankenstein might call on gene editing to eliminate diseases and endow the creature with specific qualities, including size, strength, and even hair color. Tweaking humans will get easier as scientists further unravel how our genes influence physical traits. One day, the creature could be grown in an artificial womb. Scientists warn that countless things could go wrong along the way, though, and you might end up with something monstrous, just as Frankenstein did. It's alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive.